Hello, and welcome to Baha'i Blogcast with me, your host, Rain Wilson. This is where I interview members of the Baha'i faith and other friends from all over the world about their hearts and minds and souls, their spiritual journeys, what they're interested in, and what makes them tick. Enjoy. Masood Olafani, welcome to Baha'i Blogcast. Hey, thanks, Rain. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here, man. Good to join you, brother. Oh, I... I am honored. Uh, I'm, it, it's been such a pleasure just getting to know you in the last couple of weeks. For those tuning in here in the United States and all over the world, we're in the middle of a kind of a, an uprising, a transition after the brutal murder of George Floyd and several other acts of racial injustice in the United States. We're seeing these demonstrations, and there's a lot been increased conversations, giving a little context in case you happen to be listening to this a year from now. We're having this conversation kind of in the heat of the moment, a couple weeks into this transition. And um, like I said, it's been a pleasure kind of getting to know you a little bit. I was familiar with your work before, but it, a real pleasure getting to know you and, and your perspective. Now, I'm going to start off with this before we go into your life story, and I'd love to get to know you even more. Um, you wrote an essay that was out in Baha'i Teachings today about discomfort and how talking about race is uncomfortable and therefore it can be healing because it is uncomfortable. And I have to say, as a privileged middle-aged white dude, I, sometimes like talking about race makes me feel like crawling into a hole. It just is so uncomfortable. I feel like I'm going to say the wrong thing. I feel like no one wants to hear what I have to say. I don't know what I can do. Um, sometimes I feel that white fragility and reactivity uh, come up inside of me, and I don't know what to do with that. So talk to me about this discomfort. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Um... You know, growth is a funny thing. Um, I, I don't know about your experience, but I th I'm going to just take a leap of faith and say that I think uh, growth is often accompanied by a certain level of discomfort, right? It just seems to be sure. inextricably bound to discomfort. Um, very mm -hmm. little things, whether, you know, it's an exhibition I had or a performance I did, uh, has come without some amount of pain and discomfort. So, you know, we have this in the Baha'i writings, this um, view of the issue of race in America as being the most vital and challenging issue, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So vital in the sense that it is um, of preeminent importance, uh, also vital in the sense that it has to do with, with life, right? When, when you take somebody's vital signs, it's about, you know, how their health is, what the equilibrium of mm -hmm. their, their uh, physicality is. And... Um, Challenging in the sense that, you know, it is intermingled with every aspect of our society. I mean, we've had 401 years at this, uh, and we have managed to really knit it quite large in every dimension mm. of the uh, American, uh, quote-unquote, democracy. Uh, so that indicates to me that it's going to be quite um, an undertaking to eradicate racism, quite a challenge. Uh, which also indicates to me that it's going to require um, some progressive growth, which also indicates to me that it's going to be uh, a bit uncomfortable. Um, and I think, you know, in our relationships and our interactions with people across cultural lines, we have to be willing to um, bear the burden of that discomfort for something greater. You know, it's it's a sacrifice in a way, really, you know? Oh. Yeah. That's an interesting perspective. I like that idea. Feel this discomfort, go through it, know that it's a process of growth and transformation, and that the discomfort one is feeling is a sacrifice that you're making for the greater good and it and it has to it has to be gone through. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's it's uh you know, my, my best friend, man, is, is uh, this Scottish cat, man. Um, I mean, he is a real Scott. Uh, you know, all the way from Edinburgh, Kilt Scotland. and the whole thing? Brother, sporing the whole deal, brother. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> and, you know, we, we go back some 30 years. And, uh, you know, we have had a number of intense conversations about the issue of race. And I know him. I know his heart. So there's a great deal of trust that we've developed over the years. So I know that he has my... 
I know I'm in a safe space. I can share, and he also can mm-hmm. share. And some of those conversations have been, you know, we've talked about things that would make most people uncomfortable, you know, around the issue of race. But mm. um, because we have uh, committed to the relationship, to having an honest relationship based on integrity, um, mm-hmm. and we have just said that, you know what, we're going to, this is challenging, this is uncomfortable, but hey, brother, I got your back, you got mine, love you, you know, let's walk through this experience together. And I find that those relationships, um, if we can have the courage, if we can muster the courage to face the discomfort that we will find on the other side that our relationships are much more deepened, they're much more meaningful, um, they're grounded in something that is much more uh, true and feels um, much more solid. Uh, and those, to me, are the most rewarding relationships when you can go to battle with your friend, man. And, that, and when we talk about this kind of stuff, you're going to war. I mean, this is, this is hard stuff to unpack and talk about. Um, it, it involves a lot of feelings, a lot of pain, sadness, um, anger. And so, you know, you have to face it. And if you can face it with, with, with those people that you build friendships with, um, it deepens the relationship. That's what I've found anyway. As we look around us in contemporary American society, this issue is so fraught and the passions around it are so high that there's often a great deal of argument in the debate. Uh, there's often a great deal of antagonism between parties. As we know, Baha'u'llah categorically forbids conflict and contention. It's, it's pretty clear, cut and dry, Baha'u'llah makes it super clear, no conflict, no contention as we do our work. So how do Baha'is address systematic, systemic racism without conflict and contention? Yeah, it's, uh, that's a good question. I mean, um, obviously, uh, with the events that have transpired over the last couple of weeks, um, in the wake of the death of the murder of George Floyd, there's a lot of inflamed passions. People are justifi- justifiably angry. Um, uh, there's, uh, people are bewildered. Um, they want to find a way to express themselves. And unfortunately, in the first few days of the civil unrest, there were some violent outbursts, you know, which resulted in the destruction of property. Baha'i faith, of course, has a different standard. I mean, as you said, we are forbidden um, to uh, in conflict and, um, you know, contention. And it, it, it's, it poses a real good question. How do I address those feelings that, I'm, that are very, very natural feelings that you can have surrounding an event like this, right? How do we, what is the means in a Baha'i context to uh, grapple with those feelings? It's interesting. The Baha'i faith does not say, even though conflict and contention are forbidden us, uh, it does say that we're to engage in vigorous dialogue based on honesty and truthfulness. I think the, the quote from Baha'u'llah is, out of the clash of differing opinions comes the spark of truth. So there's a sense that, you know, um, you know because the mandate of the faith, one of the mandates of the faith is peace, is, is seeking and the building of a world that is based on justice and on peace. Um, but... You know, we are to engage in this kind of vigorous dialogue to search for the truth. Um, I've often thought about, um, you know, being born in the last year of the 60s on the, in the wake of um, the activism of Malcolm X and Dr. Martin Luther King, who had very different approaches to, um, you know, addressing racial disparities in America. Of course, Malcolm X uh, not, um, you know, not being an advocate of self-defense and Dr. King uh, being a, a staunch advocate for peaceful protest. What I've, I've reflected on that, on the, on the virtues, the, the vices of both approaches. And what I've come to in light of the Baha'i teachings is that, mm. you know, this plan that we have, that we are Baha'is around the world are trying, that are attempting to execute based on the vision of Baha'u'llah, this world that is, um, you know, at its core operates um, on the basis of our um, interconnectedness and our oneness. The exercise of that plan requires a great deal of discipline and, uh, and focus. And what I have found in my own life, I, I don't know about you, but I think I'll, you probably will be able to agree in some sense with this is that 
I have found that when I have, when I go with the immediate instinct, oftentimes it is not necessarily the best instinct. Mm -hmm. So if I get in a situation where uh, I'm upset and I'm angry and my instinct is to respond violently or mm -hmm. to engage in some other type of conflict, uh, most of my experiences with that have not turned out in uh you know to 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 produce anything long lasting that is that is positive in a long lasting sense so mm -hmm. from the bahai context you know there's a lot of metaphors in the writings about battle going to war bahala uses the language of war but it is it, it's not war in the sense of physical confrontation it's a spiritual kind of war you know um in islam they talk about jihad and one of the big misunderstandings about jihad is that people have misinterpreted the understanding of that, the meaning of that, to think that you're supposed to go out and, you know, and, and, and kill people or, or sacrifice your own life for your perception of what is holy in that moment. But my understanding of what jihad is, uh, after reflecting on, on that meaning in the Quran, is that it's an internal battle. Hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's a war wage, waged with the self, with the insistent self, if you will. And in, in, in a similar sense, in the Baha'i Baha context, you know, Baha'u'llah uses all these metaphors about, you know, armor and, and warfare, but it is a spiritual warfare. It's not uh, something that is expressed um, physically and violently. And our weapons are the virtues of God. Integrity, honesty, honor, humility, wisdom, perseverance, dedication, um, sacrifice, all of these heavenly virtues, Right. And those are the weapons that we put in our query, and those are the things that we fire out into space through our hearts, through our actions. And that's how we bring about transformation in the world. So it's a way of looking at this, this, this idea of, um, of, of, of conflict um, in a different sense, maybe. Um, the conflict is with the insistent self. It's with the forces of evil, but our weapons are not physical. They are spiritual. And uh, if we're looking at the transformation, you know, the, the elimination and the eradication of racism and those two dimensions being one material and one spiritual, but the most, the more important dimension being the spiritual, because it is a sickness of the soul, then our weapons, the way that we combat that, have to be fundamentally spiritual in nature. And that's how you produce the lasting change. So, um, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's my understanding. That's, that's one mm -hmm. person's understanding of that, yeah. I feel like, and not to pile on the Baha'i community of the last 30 or 40 years, but I feel like the Baha'i community missed an opportunity back in the day, um, 70s, 80s, 90s, because, you know, if you talk to your average Joe Baha'i, they're like, yes, I, you know, all the people should get along and we're flowers of one garden and prejudice should be eliminated and I don't feel any personal prejudice towards anyone else, Um and at the same time, a lot of my friends of color who are Baha'is or friends of Baha'is or close to the Baha'i faith have felt ostracized at times, disregarded at sometimes, underrepresented uh, in other ways. And maybe we missed the opportunity for some of those more difficult and uncomfortable conversations and actions uh, back in the day. Yeah, I mean, it's it's in America, it's difficult because so much of how we approach the issue of race is tied up in the mythology that we've created around uh, America. I mean, we've bought into our propaganda. First of all, we've created a very effective type of propaganda, the shining city on the hill, the uh, mm -hmm. greatest country in the world. But we've done a really um, poor, inadequate, inept, uh, immature job at confronting our sores. And, yeah. uh, and, you know, and I think that has really informed, it, we do it on a mass scale in terms of, you know, how, um, you know, how we police people, um, you know, how we hire people, how we give people access and lock certain people out of opportunity. Mm -hmm. But then that also has an impact on interpersonal relationships. And, you know, the whole time this stuff is operating beneath the surface and we're pretending like it doesn't exist, it informs how we relate to one another. So it's not surprising that families, you know, you can look at the, uh, the, the kind of uh, the way families operate as a sociological, as a sociological study and see that families that uh, seem to have some of the most difficult challenges are the ones that don't really talk about the stuff that's, that everybody knows is going on, but nobody wants to talk about, mm -hmm. right? 
And it's the same thing when it comes to the issue of race. I mean, this, this has been the most persistent challenge that America's faced. It is the original sin. And yet we have refused to grapple with it, to deal with it. And the Baha'i community um, is made up of people who come out of that reality. And they bring some of that reality into the Baha'i community. So mm. as the world, you know, uh, has to transform and has had to transform and has, is in this process now, like we're seeing, like, um, you know, these, the civil unrest and protests, and it seems like we are finally have a, a really wonderful opportunity to grapple with this stuff in some real substantive ways. Baha'is also, we're part of the world. We're part of the community, you know. Now, the thing that's mm -hmm. different for us, right, is that we have these teachings which give us a framework for action, which give us a benchmark, something that's clear and evident. You know, the Baha'i Faith says, truthfulness is the foundation of all human virtues. Well, you mm -hmm. can't have, uh, you know, a, a friendship or you can't have a community, a sincere uh, relationships with people if you don't have truthfulness. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you can't practice all the other virtues without that as the foundation. And that includes the issue of race. We have to have honest conversations about it. Um, you know, we're called to do that as Baha'is. And also, uh, you know, that is something that all humanity should be striving for, to have the courage to s step deeply into the truth, feel the discomfort of it, the pain, the sadness, the anger, whatever it is. Breathe it in, witness to it, and then let it go. And mm. we, ha we, mm. haven't we haven't gone through that process. We haven't gone through that process. We haven't done it yet. No, we have not. We have not. Well, let's let's go back in time a little bit. How did you uh, find the Baha'i Faith? And tell me a little bit about your life story, your background, and where you come from, because I don't know it. Yeah, yeah. You know, man, it's interesting. I, I, I kind of, you know, I was born in L.A., um, San Fernando Valley, Los Angeles County Hospital back in the day, the last year of the 60s. So we're talking 69, April 27th, literally nearly a year after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King on April 4th, 1968. So I'm born into, you know, that cauldron of, um, you know, of social unrest and protest, you know, that was the 60s, you know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we moved to New York after a bad earthquake in like the early 70s. I, don't, I forget which earthquake that was. It was early 70s. And um, so I was in New York and, uh, and uh, was there for a while uh, living out in um, uh, near Long Island. And then my parents um, moved to Florida, so I was in Florida for a while, lived in New Orleans. Uh, you know, I had a varied kind of experience regionally in the United States, which mm. gave me kind of, um, I'm, I'm grateful for it now. There were some, some difficulties associated with it. It's not easy to make friends and then leave them all the time. But it also gave me awareness of um, a cross-section of, you know, types and personalities that exist throughout America, which was, has been very helpful for me. Um, and, you know, I, I, um, when my parents divorced, my mother moved back to New York and I was jumping back and forth between the South and the North for several years. Mm -hmm. Um, and it gave me an understanding of how racism operates in the North as opposed to how it operates in the South. Ooh, do tell. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, there's a, there, you know, the North historically has, um, there's, America's made up of a number of mythologies, right? The North, um, uh, you know, has quite often, uh, part of its mythology is saying that, uh, you know, racism that exists here, that's a Southern problem, you know. But uh, mm. we know that that's, you know, that that's a lie. I mean, I, we can count countless examples where um, people have been oppressed, subjugated, or what have you, uh, and all of those things uh, have happened in the North as well as in the South. Mm. Um, so, you know, it, 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 was, uh, it, it was really interesting to grow up in, in, in those two different environments and experience how the issue of race operated in Southern culture and then how it operated uh, in the North. And the lines, I would say, it's interesting because in the South, the lines are clearly drawn, but you have this kind of like vast landscape. Um, whereas in the North, in New York, where I grew up, you know, things are compressed. So you have communities that are definitely segregated um, but they're compressed within this metropolis called Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, the, the borders feel a bit more permeable. Like you can, you know, you can walk from Little Italy, you can go into Chinatown, you, can, you know, wherever, what have you, you know. Um, but you still feel um, a kind of 
there definitely is a sense that you are crossing a border into another another community, another world. And that, mm. that sometimes is a wonderful experience and sometimes it can be problematic as well. So, I, you know, I, I kind of grew up with those experiences and um, I went to um, a high school in Newark, New Jersey, arts high school, the oldest arts high school in the country. Shout out to arts high school. Love you guys. Wow. And wow. yeah, and then I uh, uh, went to college at uh, Morehouse and uh, did some graduate work at, um, at uh, Savannah College of Art and Design. In 1992, I was a student at Morehouse. Um, I was um, a sophomore, and I was dating a young woman at Spelman. You know, um, it's always those Spelman women that get us Morehouse men. That's the way it works. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, and uh, she, uh, at the time, I had gone on a deep spiritual search, and um, I had come to the conclusion that I wanted to be a priest, an Episcopalian kind, the ones that can get married. I, I was clear about that. Okay. <laughs> and, and my <laughs> nice, girl, good. Yeah, and my girlfriend at the time. Yeah, good choice. Yeah, mm-hmm. my girlfriend at the time uh, was good friends with an uh, older administrator at Spelman College who happened to be a Baha'i. I had never heard about the Baha'i faith. So she went to this woman who was a dear friend of hers, and she said, you know, I'm seeing this guy. I like him. He says he wants to be a priest, but he's not a priest, but he might like the Baha'i faith. And uh, so she arranged an introduction between me and this woman. Um, and uh, this woman's name is Jamila Kennedy. She's a very active Baha'i here in the Atlanta community. As soon as we met, we felt like we knew each other from another time. It was a very deep spiritual connection. Hmm. And uh, it was through her that I learned about the Baha'i faith initially and uh, exposure to the writings through her as well. And uh, then to the community through firesides, which are gatherings of Baha'is around the world in different communities where they sh- people share their um, perspectives on the faith, on some aspect of the faith with community uh, members at large. And, uh, and, and that's how I found uh, the faith. And that was 1992, which is Fruit of the Holy Year, which was the 100th anniversary of the passing of the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith, Baha'u'llah. Ah, and uh, oh, yeah. so it, you know, that's a date that I can never forget because it's so associated with uh, the Fruit of the Holy Year. So. <laughs> Was that when the Baha'i Conference was in New York? Yeah, the World Congress, yeah, in New York. World Congress, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I became a Baha'i a little bit after that, so I missed okay. World Congress, but, um, you know, they were, the Baha'is were celebrating that entire year, so I was able to go to some celebrations here in Atlanta. And um, So what did, your, what did your family and friends think of this? All of a sudden, you're a sophomore, junior in college, and yeah. um, on a spiritual search, and you become a member of some weird-sounding religion. Yeah, you know, my my mother and my dad, man, were like young adults, man, in the flower child generation, man, the kind of beatnik kind of, you know, um, Mm -hmm. free love kind of era. So I think they just kind of had a hands-off approach. You know, my mother wound up becoming a Baha'i not too long after I did. So she found out about the faith through me. Wow, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Um, So they, they kind of, I think my father, you know, looked at me always growing up and said, man, this kid is a little different. So when I became a Baha'i, he's like, oh, that's just one of those different things that Masood does. So whatever. <laughs> so, um, so they weren't, they weren't, they were kind of neutral. They weren't, um, they weren't like supportive, but they also weren't, they weren't not supportive either. They just kind of mm-hmm. let me alone mm-hmm. and let me kind of discover for myself, which I'm grateful to because it could have been different. It could have been very different. How did it affect your life or change your life? Oh man. Um, you know, I, my father gave me very wise advice when I was younger. Um, I was struggling, I think, trying to um, understand my identity, right? Um, trying to figure out my place in the world. My father told me, he saw me struggling. He said, look, you know, always read your Bible. And I'm very glad that he told me that because uh, the Bible gave me some semblance of right and wrong and a framework for how to behave in my private life and in my public life. But my interaction with religion up until that point had been um, somewhat disappointing. I would go to church. Generally speaking, it was a black church. Um, It wasn't, you didn't see, um, you know, diversity in the churches that I went to for the most part. Right, yeah. And I always found that problematic. I couldn't understand, you know, the teachings of Jesus, the the parables, the, I mean, they seemed so transcendent and they seemed like they cut across um, 
identity. It didn't matter where you came from. They should be able to speak to your soul. So I couldn't understand why the church was so segregated. And then, mm. and then, um, who was it that said that the most segregated hour in America in the American week is Sunday at noon? Yeah, yeah, it's it's a shame, but it is. And um, you know, and 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 I understand the history, what where that comes from. But um, you know, you don't have to continue to practice something that's not right. You can you can change things. So when I came in contact with the Baha'i Faith and learned that the core principle of the faith was the oneness of mankind, it caught my attention. I was like, hmm, okay. All right, I like that. That feels right to me, you know? And then I met some of the Baha'is, and they there was a genuine sense of love and appreciation. I don't want to give the impression that Baha'is are perfect. We certainly are not. But I could see people wrestling with, trying to build this community that was rooted in a kind of, um, in this notion of the oneness of mankind, the vision of Baha'u'llah. So that was very meaningful mm. to me. And then the other principles which were astonishing to me, things like the harmony of science and religion. I mean, are you kidding me? I mean, it seems like the rift between science and religion has existed, um, you know, for eternity. Of years. Exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. And um, so the faith was speaking to me in these fundamental ways, the equality of women and men, universal education for everybody on the planet, spiritual solutions to social economic problems. Very powerful. But did it, but it, did it change how you lived your life and the choices that you made absolutely the course of your life after that decision absolutely i mean i think uh just my the, the in several significant ways um service is such a profoundly um um foundational element in the bahai faith right uh, up until that point i I'd be quite honest with you i did not have a heart for service i didn't um mm -hmm. understand it didn't uh link it to um to like spiritual growth and development. Um, and I, and quite honestly, I thought service was about the other person. It took me a while to realize that I was getting a lot out of serving personally as well. Uh, mm. So it changed the way I approach my understanding of service and seeing it as intricately, um, as an intricate part of spiritual growth and development. So that was one thing. Um, it changed the way that I consciously began to look at my circle of friends um, and began to consciously develop, associate in circles, in diverse circles. Because up until that point, I think most of my friends were African-American. It's just what I was accustomed to. It's what I grew up in. Um, but the faith is so much about the oneness of mankind. It's like something that you can't, it's inescapable. So you're constantly confronted with that. So I started to look around and I started to see, ah, um, maybe I need to think about you know, um, really expanding this circle and interacting with some other people. So that's an mm -hmm. area as well. Um, you know, it, it, it changed my notion of community. You know, I, I came from a broken home, man. I mean, uh, you know, it was hard, dude. I mean, um, one of the things that was very challenging for me was trust. Um, it was very difficult. And I, 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 I had a very difficult time believing that someone didn't mean me harm or that I felt like I was mm. the best caretaker of myself. I didn't feel like it was safe to allow somebody else to do that. And then mm. coming into the community and, uh, you know, and, and meeting some of the wonderful souls that I've met, they, it slowly began to, you know, I began to relax and feel that I was in safe hands. And, um, you know, and, and, so that, that was a, a process where I felt like I could breathe a bit more and allow myself just to fall into that. Um, it hasn't always, I mean, there have been challenges. Personalities are difficult sometimes. You don't get along with everybody. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, um, I have grown tremendously in, in, in terms of my ability to um, step out and trust a bit more and to um, develop this sense of community that um, you know is based on on justice and love and forgiveness and all of those things and and really see it as a safe place and let go of um, of, of of the feeling that somebody's going to uh, do something to me behind my back. You know, as a black person, that's hard too, man. That, that's difficult because as a mm -hmm. black man moving in public spaces, there's this you're constantly assaulted with this frenetic kind of energy within your being that you feel like you're being surveilled. So that's part of the mix too, right? So mm -hmm. you're looking for spaces that you can go and you can feel a sense of community and acceptance so that you can mm -hmm. lay that burden of, of um, anxiety down a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and feel for a few moments, a few hours, 
that you're in a safe space. And um, certainly there have been more moments than I can recount in my experience in the bi community where I have felt more safe than I've felt in the general community. And thank God that's because of the teachings of Baha'u'llah. Because Baha'is aren't perfect, but the faith, the teachings, um, provide us an opportunity to check ourselves on a daily basis. So, yeah, it's it's interesting. It just uh, you know, as a side conversation, because I want to hear more about your journey and your story. Um, as I've been, you know, really over the last couple of years, looking at this concept of white privilege, you know, and as I speak to African American friends of mine, Baha'is and non-Baha'i, to realize like I have never in my life, not one second been looked at sideways in any way, shape, or form. I've never been followed in a store. I've never been surveilled by security. I've never had had a double take by someone behind a cash register. I've never had a police officer look at me twice. When I've been pulled over, it's like, good morning, officer. And they're like, hello there, Sonny. And it's been, you know, all above board. And, you know, for me to try and just take in like what you were saying, uh, like in a deep way, like what what that must be to be surveilled, watched, mistrusted, people sneaking glances, wondering, uh, you know, what might be up with you simply because of the color of your skin. I've never had to experience that, not one moment of my life. I'm n- so... Uh, there's a there's a strange kind of privileged oblivion that you live in when you're when you've never had to deal with that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's you know, it's it's uh, it's you know, it, it begins with uh, you know very early on. I mean, when you when you don't understand, I know I didn't anyway. I think most uh, children of African descent, African Americans, when you're young, you just don't you don't know what that feeling is about. You know, something's a little different, but you you don't have a context for it. You know, and then your parents have that conversation with you, um, as most black parents have, because they're concerned about the survival of their children. You know, how do you behave in public? What happens when you um, get pulled over by the police? Mm. And all of that is about this history of um, you know of of just uh, perpetual surveillance. Um, and also that goes on, you know, you, you can trace it all the way back to the time of slavery. It goes through um, the time of the Ku Klux Klan um, and then through um, basically Gestapo-like uh, policing methods in black and brown communities. So there's a very real, um, it's in the DNA, I think, of African Americans um, to wrestle with that. It is uh, part and parcel of how we have been socialized. Um, you know, it's, it's, um, you just have to consider it. You know, it's interesting because, you know, from the Baha'i perspective, we have what we call a primary identity and a secondary identity, right? Um, our primary identity is our spiritual identity. That is what Mm -hmm. unites us all. That's you and I, we're brothers because of our primary identity, our spiritual identity. We're two souls inhabiting bodies for 80 or 90 years undergoing spiritual tests, giving service, growing on a journey to meet our creator, uh, regardless of what, whether we have melatonin in our skin or not. Right. Exactly. And then you have what we call secondary identities. Those are the lesser identities, or the ways that we define ourselves. I'm an African-American male. You know, um, I'm an artist, an actor. You know, you're a white American male. You're an actor, an artist. You know, um, we have all these other ways that we kind of define ourselves. But, you know, holding those two realities, on the one hand, my primary identity is, is rooted in uh, this spiritual reality. And then I have this second identity, the secondary identity, which is of less significance than the primary identity. However, the secondary identity comes with social implications and consequences that I have to consider. So how do yeah. I hold those two realities? There's a tension that exists there as a person of African descent, because you are pulled, you, you feel yourself, something inside of all of us, this kind of knowing that there is something deeper there, which is that spiritual essence that exists in every human being. And you, it, it connects us all, this kind of vibrational frequency that exists throughout humanity. But then you also realize there is something that I have absolutely no control over, 
which is the color of my skin, which comes with a history and social implications, and I have to account for that on a daily basis. Mm. And what, mm. is that, what does that mean? And how do I process that? And how do I exist at the nexus of that tension? Yeah, they both influence each other. It's not it's not one separate from the other. You know, my, you know, honestly, privileged suburban whiteness influences the growth and development of my soul. Our environment affects our souls and our souls can affect the environment. There's a kind of a dance between, you know, our personal journey and our journey of service in the world and, the, you know, the world outside of us and the world inside of us. You know, one, one of the things that I love the most about the African-American community, I, there are many things I love about the African-American community, is our ecstatic sense of worship, which mm. comes out of pain, right? Mm. Mm. The enslaved African on the plantation dealing with the drudgery of working for free, dealing with the, the um, sense of foreboding that you might do something that the... That the um, owner or the master of the house uh, gets angry about and, and punishes you, um, the fear of being sold and um, lost to your family and loved ones, you know, they had to find a way to release that, that um, frenetic kind of tension that existed within them, that sense that something was going to happen. And what came out of that was the field holler songs, you know, down on the plantation, you know. Mm, with mm. their coded messages that would help people escape from the deep south across the Ohio River, follow the drinking gourd, you know, steal away Jesus, you know, um, all of these amazing songs with these coded meanings. And you go from that, you get uh, out of that, you, you get the blues, man, you get the spirituals, then you get jazz, mm. man, you get, you get hip hop, man, you get bebop, you get all that stuff. And it, all of it's rooted in this ecstatic, kind of sense of release which comes out of our sense of our connection to the divine and seeking that connection as a way to escape the anguish the hell that we were living in and mm. um and so so you know for me you know f dealing with that sense of uh you know of, of, of being an african-american male and walking through public spaces in America and all of the history that's tied to that. You know, I, I have to go back to the spirit, man, when stuff gets tough, man. I meditate, I say prayers, brother, I might sing a song, man, I might sing an old spiritual, man, I might, you know, but I've got to give the soul release. I paint or sculpt or I act or whatever, you know? And uh, so God's been merciful for me in that way and he's given me some ways to to express it. and. Uh, but, you know, the black community has been doing that since we've gotten here. That's, that's one of the key ways that we have survived and endured. That's, and, and that takes me back to your life story. So you're talking about expression and using that also as a tool to cope with pain in your life. Uh, tell me about your journey as an artist. What kind of work do you make? How do you, I've seen a bunch of your stuff online. I was researching very interesting, a lot of sculpture, site-specific stuff, very, you know, tangible, like you can, you can touch it and taste it and see it um and uh, uh very affecting tell me about that journey yeah well you know I, uh, art something i've been doing since i was four years old um my mother was very active in recognizing that uh, i had a facility for drawing when i was very young and i was fortunate enough to have a mother who also loved the arts and uh and would take me to museums and get me books on famous artists so she cultivated uh, that uh, that that gift in me, you know, that facility in me, and so I I drew all through through uh, grade school, through high school, and on into college. I just drew all the time. I mean, literally. Now, when you're saying drawing, are you draw? What are you drawing? Like comic books? You're drawing cartoons or what? Comic books. I mean, comic books with extensive plot lines, brother. I mean, character studies, everything. <laughs> you know. So uh, I, you know, a lot of kids on Saturdays would be out running the streets. I would do that sometimes, but a lot of times, man, I'd just be sitting in front of my little black and white TV, some Duralite pencils and a bunch of office paper that mom brought for, back from the law office that she worked at, and I was in heaven, man. I was, I was grooving. I'd do that for six or seven hours a day, you know. <laughs> so it kept me company, man. It, it was um, um, art was my babysitter, my um, companion, you know, my way to unlock a another universe to create a different space. When things got difficult in the spaces that I was living, I could draw my way out of it. I could um, 
it would give me access to some other worlds. And, you know, when I, when I, you know, going into college and getting that training, the formalist training and understanding the history of art, and that begins to inform your practice. And then, you know, for me, um, you, you know, there's a long tradition of the artist having a very specific role in the black community, you know, and part of that comes out of Africa. I mean, there's this kind of integrated approach to knowledge that is very kind of indigenous African, um, um, you know, kind of grounded. It's not separate where you would look at like mathematics as being very separate from the visual arts or creativity. They're kind of very much more integrated. So, you know, the role for me of the artist, um, you know, um, is really about service. I mean, that's my understanding of it, right? So that informs mm. what I create. I mean, I'm not thinking... There's nothing wrong with people just doing arts for art's sake, you know, just making something abstract, a shape, a color. That's what you're motivated to do. For me, for whatever reason, the way I'm wired, I respond to the world around me to provide context for myself and hopefully for others. So I deal with issues like social stratification, racism, um, marginalization, sexism, um, the soul's aspiration for transcendence. Um, ways of, um, you know, um, constructive resilience, you know, all of these different things inform the practice. So I'm always, my, you know, my, I think that the biggest tool that any artist has, I don't care what your discipline is, is awareness. Is just walking through the world, being aware, studying, observing, being open to what is presented to you. So I might be walking down the street, I might see an object on a railroad track. I have absolutely no idea what I'm gonna do with it, man. I take it back to the studio, it sits on a shelf somewhere for maybe nine months. And then one day I pass it in the studio, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's it. And oh, I know nice. exactly what to do with it. So, you know, there, there's, there's, there, there's all of these kind of processes going on inside me, the creative process, but it's always linked to service. How can this practice, this thing that I do, hopefully give the, the, the people who interact with the work maybe a, a broader understanding of what it is to be human, um, help mm -hmm. them to think about maybe their connection to other beings in a different way, mm -hmm. and maybe expose them to some experiences that they weren't aware of. So it's very tied to, to kind of um, an engagement with, with, uh, with the public in a kind of social action way, I would say in a way. Mm -hmm. And can you give us an example of uh, an installation or artwork that you've undertaken that uh, marries successfully the kind of beauty and aesthetic of making something art, yeah. artful, mm -hmm. um, and also has that kind of service and social impact component? Sure, yeah. I, I just completed a, um, a, a piece called Elder, which uh, commemorates the David T. Howard School um, here in Atlanta. Uh, David T. Howard was a formerly enslaved person um, here in Georgia who, after um, the enslaved uh, people were freed, he was able to establish a very successful undertaking business, which is one of the few areas that was open to African Americans to go into and get a business. With, mm -hmm. with the money, some of the money that he made, he bought several acres of land, and upon that land, he built a school which came to be known as the David T. Howard School. David T. Howard School... Um, went on to become, you know, just an extraordinary breeding ground of black intellectual talent and creative, creative talent as well. You have people like Dr. Martin Luther King was a student there, Maynard Jackson, the first African-American mayor of Atlanta, Georgia, Vernon Jordan, who was in President Bill Clinton's cabinet, uh, mm -hmm. a host of talented men and women who um, contributed, um, you know, to their community. So, they had a, the school originally, um, and initially it started off as a grade school and middle school, and then it transitioned to a high school. But originally it had a series of old growth elm trees that ringed the perimeter of the school, right? Mm -hmm. And these trees went back, um, you know, 100, 150 years. And mm -hmm. so the school over the years had fallen into disrepair. The community that the school is in, which is right down the street from the King Center, um, they decided that they wanted to refurbish and revitalize the school and give it to a new generation of students. And okay. so what they wanted to do was to engage an artist to take one of the old growth elm trees that they were unearthing because they were going to plant new trees, 
Um, they want an artist to use one of those trees and integrate the history of the school and some of the alumni into a public work of, work of art. So they approached me about mm. this project. Uh, it had all of the elements that I like to engage around. We're talking about history, um, memory, uh, social justice, uh, spiritual kind of um, uh, spiritual kind of resonance that felt um, just very, very vital and very um, inspiring. And so I took one of the old growth elm trees, uh, turned it on its side, prostrate. And, and this tree's been around for 100 or so years. It's got all these interesting objects that it has consumed. There's a stop sign embedded in it. There's a chain link ah. fence embedded in it. And uh, I turned it on its side, prostrate in this green space across the street from the school. And then I met with some of the alumni from the school, uh, the oldest being a woman who's 94, who was part of the original graduating class uh, the first high school graduating class from wow. David T. Howard back in the 40s. Yeah. And I made castings of their hands. And then what I did was to sculpt a series of arms and join the hands on the arms, and I integrated those arms into the branches on the tree. So they look like they're growing out of the carcass of the tree. Oh, wow. wow. So they're reaching, the gestures are pointing and reaching. So they're reaching the, the green spaces directly across from the school, kind of diagonally in the Freedom in Freedom Park, which is one of the main parks here in Atlanta. So the hands gesture back across the street towards the school from which the tree mm. came from. So there's this, this idea of linking what has been to what is now, the past mm. to the present moment, collapsing time, and these elders, in a sense, being these mobile libraries of memory and history and making that readily available to the next generation of students who will come through David T. Howard School. Wow, that's beautiful. That's, that's amazing. And oddly enough, uh, you're a multidisciplinary artist. Uh, you started acting several years ago and uh, kind of stumbled into that. And I, I love the idea that you're working both in the visual arts and uh, in performance. How, how did that happen? Tell me about your actor's journey. Yeah, you know, my dad will tell you, man, I've been acting a fool since I was four, but I finally figured out how to get paid for it. So, you know, uh, you know I, I always had a flair for the dramatic. I think uh, growing up, I, I looking back on it, I was always kind of performing um, for my parents, for my friends or whatever. Um, and, you know, when I was... I, when I was in school, I did a few school plays, Princess and the Frog, little things like that. Uh, I did a version of Raisin in the Sun. Wait a minute. I was in Princess and the Frog in high school. I'm not kidding. <laughs> I did it in grade school, man. I, I, yeah. I, I, we did story theater version in high school, and I was the frog of the frog. No, I was the frog prince. The frog prince. Who 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 were you? That's the part that I played. <laughs> you were the, yeah. We both were the frog prince. Dude, this is like a stop the presses moment. This is like this is like oh synchronicity God. here. <laughs> the connection, the connection. It's deep, brother. This is, it runs deep. This man. is transcendent. Okay, good. So anyway. So yeah, so I did a version of Raising in the Sun in high school, and uh, you know, got to college. I, I didn't look. There was nobody in my family who was in acting. I had no real role models in terms of anybody that was accessible so I could see what the journey was like, right? So it just seemed like a far off thing that I kind of had a a bit of a facility for I enjoyed doing, but I had no understanding of how to get there, you know. Sure. You know, I got to college and uh, didn't do anything really while I was at Morehouse. I was pretty deeply ensconced in the visual arts. But when I got to grad school at SCAD, um, there was literally, there was an ad in the newspaper for a play called The Meeting written by a guy named Jeff Stetson. And the meeting basically um, dramatizes a fictitious meeting between Dr. Martin Luther King and Malcolm X in a Harlem hotel room over a long weekend. Um, and you can imagine the kind of debates if a meeting like that actually happened that they were having philosophically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I go in for this. I'm like, wow, that's really interesting. I love Dr. King. Um, you know, I'm a Morehouse grad. Dr. King is Morehouse's most famous graduate, you know. So, um, and I also dug Malcolm X. So I, I grew up learning all of Dr. King's speeches, most of them anyway. So I assumed that I was going to go in and audition for Dr. King. So I go in, the director looks at me, he's like, dude, no way. He's like, maybe Malcolm. Let me hear you read from Malcolm. <laughs> so I read from Malcolm, he liked what I did. So um, I got the part as Malcolm, and then the play got good reviews. And, um, and then I just started talking to people, like, how do I, you know, what do I need to do? What's the next step? They said, well, you need to get an agent. 
And um, so I started off with an agent, actually. Um, I, I was able to get on with the uh, one of the larger agencies here in Atlanta, but it was as a voiceover talent initially. And mm -hmm. one day I said to them, you know, I'd like to try some stuff in front of the camera. And they said, okay, well, you know, we'll audition you on this date. So I go into the office, into the boardroom. All of the different department heads are there. It was the weirdest experience of my life. They gave me a script. They said, hey, look over this for two minutes, and then let's see what you do with it. So I looked over, mm -hmm. I did it. They didn't like what I did, and they started representing me for film and television. And, um, and which, which, by the way, actor to actor, is, is a terrible way to... To, to, to gauge your talent because you're just gauging cold reading skills, you know, and that's not what acting is. I mean, it's a facet of acting and some people are really good at that, but some people are, are notoriously bad. Like Sean Penn is notoriously bad at auditioning and doing, you know, he's got to work on stuff, brilliant actor, but it, you know, he's got to deeply find his character and his connection. So that that's unfortunate, Yeah, but it worked out for the best anyway. Yeah, it seemed to. And I, I mean, I think, you know, it, that was the part that you're talking about was the most unnerving part for me was going into auditions and there's just a table there's like several people behind it they're looking at you it was just really a weird process to get used to so i know i yeah. completely nerved my way out of several roles that i could have easily done but I, you know i was sure. getting to know the process and something clicked along the way i just said you know what i'm just gonna have fun dude i'm, I'm not gonna want this as i don't want to hold this too tight because i'm gonna squeeze the life out of it so I've mm, got to I've mm. got to allow it to breathe and just go in there and have a good time man and and control what I can control the other part I can't control you know <laughs> so yeah so it got a lot more fun and a lot easier that way <laughs> so you've got a podcast uh, on Baha'i teachings America's most challenging issue podcast tell me about the podcast and what I would love to hear is what what have you learned by doing this podcast like you never thought of before. Or never considered before? You know, for me, I think uh, one of the most informative things for me has been the, the, the really creative ways that a cross-section of individuals informed by the Baha'i teachings is working to really help to push the process of the eradication of racism forward. Um, mm. That You know, I, I, I think about it, I think about my contribution in a certain way. Um, and I, you know, I frame it in a certain way that feels right for me, and I go full bore on, in that process. But some, mm -hmm. of the, some of the ways that some of my guests have talked about what it is that they do and they're engaged, and I'm like, wow, that is just really amazing. I never would have thought about approaching this mm -hmm. subject that way. And so it has expanded, really, my understanding of the various different ways that we can make a contribution and how, you know, within this framework of action, you know, which, you know, the Baha'i world is involved in this framework of action, which is kind of rooted in community building, right? There's, it's, it's not a constrictive thing. There's all of this expansive field that you can kind of play in and apply your creativity and your gifts to make your contribution. So for me, it was just like that, that was like super um, eye opening and revealing. And then some of the concepts, man, I, one of my guests, man, a, a, she said something that I cannot stop using, a phrase, cultural literacy, which I love, cultural competency. Mm. I just love that phrase, you know? And, and so, you know, I'll hear little things like that, little gems, little nuggets um, about, you know, how they're thinking about the issue of race, how they're noticing areas that need to be addressed, even some subtle things that maybe I hadn't even thought about. And I'm like, it's just eye-opening. So it's this constant experience of me being of going through this process of learning i'm sharing you know i'm opening this space for these incredible souls to like share what it, what it is they're doing and i'm just i'm a student i'm just soaking it up man and and, and taking and borrowing and applying what feels right and then if i don't feel like i can do it myself i'm just sitting back and like yo man i just want to watch you dance man i love watching you do what you do it's just beautiful keep doing it you know what i'm saying so yeah that's amazing. That's great. Well, we'll we'll put a link in uh, so people can check out the link to to those podcasts. So, um, going back to the most vital and challenging issue, Shoghi Effendi says in the advent of divine justice, the ceaseless exertions which this issue of paramount importance calls for, the sacrifices it must impose, the care and vigilance it demands. 
the moral courage and fortitude it requires, the tact and sympathy it necessitates, invest this problem with an urgency and importance that cannot be overestimated. And, uh, you know, as I read these, you look at the number of tasks in front of you when you read that sentence. Exertions, sacrifices, care, vigilance, courage, fortitude, tact, sympathy. Um, that's some hard work. Uh, what do we do? Where do we go? Well, you know, I think one thing we can't, we can't do, we, we must make sure that we do not do, is become paralyzed because we don't think that we're going to do it right. Um, none of us are doing oh, it. That's, that's good. That's, 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 really, that's a really good thing to hear. Yeah. I mean, I think yeah. we have to let that go. I mean, first of all, being a Baha'i, if you're concerned about being a perfect Baha'i, you're not going to do nothing because nobody is a perfect mm-hmm. Baha'i. <laughs> so I think you got to let that part of it go. Um, and I think you have to proceed, you know, um, first of all, with a heart that you got to check yourself, your heart, see where you are, do an internal check. Am I, am I, I'm concerned about this issue. I want to make a contribution. The writings tell me, the Baha'i writings tell me I'm to be concerned about this issue in a very, like, um, urgent way. And I want to make a contribution. So just check yourself, and then study. You know, study those writings, like from Shoghi Effendi that you read, um, the, the the writings from Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha, and then just try your best, man, to apply that to your um, the way that you uh, exert yourself in the field, um, the way that you apply your talents, your intellect, all of your being, and and just be prepared to learn, to stumble, to make mistakes, be forgiving of yourself. And also be forgiving of others. Forgiveness is key, man. Forgiveness and persistence. You know, the Universal House of Justice, the supreme governing body, talks about in one of their letters that those are indispensable qualities that we have to bring to this work. Perseverance mm-hmm. and forgiveness. So am I going to get frustrated sometimes when somebody may be, you know, outside of my cultural context might say the wrong thing? Sure. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, you know, maybe they, uh, you know, uh, come in with like a savior mentality sometimes, you know, or whatever, whatever it is, whatever the thing is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I notice that I make mistakes when I go into different cultural context, you know, when I I remember when the first time I went into a Persian household, there were a lot of Persians in the Baha'i community. I had never taken my shoes off in anybody's home before. I was like, what is this taking the shoes off? <laughs> you know, so it took me a while. I'd be in the house. I'd be walking through these homes with my shoes on. Everybody else has got their shoes off. And then finally, I'm like, oh, okay, I need to take my shoes off next time. But they were patient with me, and they allowed me. Nobody castigated me or maligned me. So I think we have to be patient with each other. Um, but patience does not, patience should not be mistaken for an absence of honesty. We have to be patient. We also have to be lovingly honest and, com- and, and operate from a position of truth. So, um, so, you know, holding those two things, you know, in balance, you know, encouraging one another. Shoghi Effendi says that one of the most utilized, un- underutilized forces in the Baha'i community is the power of encouragement. We mm. have to mm. encourage each other constantly, you know. Mm. White Baha'is have to encourage their black brothers and sisters, you know, mm. um, encourage us, you know, um, in a variety of different ways. Black Baha'is have to encourage our white brothers and sisters. Keep showing mm. up. Keep being present. Yeah, you made a mistake. Mm. It's okay. Let's work through it. We're in this together. I'm with you. Mm. You know, mm. I'm not going to, I'm not going to coddle you. I'm not going to treat you like a baby because I know you can handle it. Um, we're going to have a, a relationship based on integrity. But we're in this together, holding hands, marching through this work together. And so, you know, it's not perfect. We, ref- we make mistakes. We refine. We learn from those mistakes. And we apply those learnings as we go forward. And all of those actions congeal into this really beautiful broadening and flowering of this reality of the beloved community. And that's where we're all trying to get to. That's why we're working and doing what we're doing. That's beautifully said. And listen, there's a lot of people out there doing some incredible work uh, in in race issues. <clears throat> you know, breaking systemic racism, healing wounds of racism and trauma, bringing people together. But what do we have as Baha'is 
that's different than what's being done in the outside world. Not that we should ignore, we should participate in what's being done in the in the quote unquote non Baha'i world uh, by all means. But w- what do we have? What tools do you feel like Baha'u'llah has brought us to heal this issue on a on a deeper level? I guess the the example I always bring up is, you know, we've passed a lot of laws. You know, we we've 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 abolished slavery. You know, we've passed we abolished Jim Crow laws and Brown versus Board of Education and uh and but that hasn't changed people's hearts. There's still a large percentage of the United States that, you know, could be described as racist in, in some capacity. So what tools do we have as Baha'is? What hope can we offer beyond what's being done out there? You know, Dr. King used to say that uh racism was a spiritual sickness or disease, that if we don't heal it, we will discover that it is a sickness unto death. Um, Mm -hmm. Primarily the way that America is, uh, that um, those who have been on the side of of social justice, racial justice, the elimination of bigotry, primarily uh, the mechanism that they have used is the courts, is passing legal laws. Um, But what we haven't really addressed and what we haven't reconciled with, that there are two realities associated with uh, an issue um, such as racism. One of those realities is material, which is passing laws to provide more access for opportunity. It's very important, very important. But the even more important, the, 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 the more foundational or the cornerstone of any enduring um, kind of reconciliation has to be based on a spiritual transformation because that acts as the guardrails to protect the laws and the legislation that is passed. Because if you don't have a transformation of the heart or the soul, people will find ways around, they'll duck around, they'll fly over, they'll find ways to undermine legislation that's passed, laws, programs that are put in place, because the heart hasn't been transformed. Mm -hmm. So from the Baha'i perspective, it's about really attacking the problem at causal root, which is in the soul. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. at the same time, we're working, we're, we're, we're standing up for justice, be be it in the legal field or whatever, and in the various ways that we do. But there is a deep awareness that we have to be focused on the power of the revelation to transform the hearts. And it's right there in in Baha'u'llah's teachings. I mean, the Baha'i writings are replete with references about how we were created from the same substance. Noble I made thee, why why dost thou abase thyself? You know, um, Mm -hmm. I created you all from one same substance, you know? You are Mm -hmm. the Mm -hmm. the fruits of uh, the flowers of one garden, the fruits of one tree, you know? You were created from the same dust, yeah. All of these, all of these references, all of these beautiful writings, on a daily basis, as we, you know, interact with the writings, reinforce our understanding of the, the, the just the unassailable reality of our interconnectedness. Right. So, if you come into the faith, you interact with the faith, and maybe you come from a community where, maybe you've held some ideas coming into the faith about certain groups of people. And then you interact with these writings on a daily basis. It's like, whoa, you're constantly being immersed in a sea of oneness and interdependence. And that impacts the heart. Baha'is, we have the most powerful, there are several things that are key to this process of transforming the heart for us. First of all, being an example. Trying to live as much as we can by the teachings of the faith. Realizing that we're never going to do it perfect. But we try to be excellent. We try to have a standard of excellence in how we live our life as a Baha'i, right? That means when it comes to the issue of race, we develop and build sincere relationships across cultural lines. That is a priority that are substantive, that are meaningful, right? So we demonstrate in our action our commitment to this principle, right? Hmm. Getting involved in a field of service, you know? Um, showing through our actions, our engagement with not only Baha'is, but like-minded souls who um, aren't, you know, associated with the Baha'i community, um, but who share spiritually, maybe um, who are goal-oriented in similar ways that the Baha'is are. So there's a like-mindedness about 
the eradication of racism. So we, we want to partner with those people. We can learn from those individuals. The Baha'i community is a lot that can learn. Um, mm -hmm. But the, re the revelation has, because it is, from a Baha'i perspective, we believe it is divine in origin. It is infused with a power that is beyond the material existence. It transcends whatever laws you can pass, whatever legislation you can put in place, all of that. It is the glue, really, that knits us together hmm. and preserves hmm. justice and truthfulness and, in essence, in that sense, preserves the integrity and the dignity for all humanity. Beautifully said. And... How do you think the institute process, the core activities, the grassroots work that Baha'is are doing can be used as tools to eradicate racism and tools that we can draw the outside community into? Yeah. Well, you know, it's so much of, of the misunderstandings that exist between cultural groups is because we don't know each other, right? Mm -hmm. The institute process that Baha'is are engaged in all over the world is about community building. Basically, it is, you know, I think at a fundamental level, I like to think of it as you are building community with like this amazing super gorilla glue of the writings of the holy writings. <laughs> so you're building, you're, you're building community that's grounded in um, God's teachings. So it's not just me showing up and saying, you know, uh, meeting a neighbor and whatnot, and we go out and we, you know, have dinner together. No, it, the, the, the connections and the friendships have to happen at a deeper level than that. So you're coming together, you're having devotional gatherings, you're inviting people into your home. I know now we can't do that, so a lot of people are doing it on different platforms virtually. You're sharing um, some of the sacred writings from the various different, um, you know, world religions. You're having fellowship. That's community building. Um, you're doing hmm. perhaps the most sacred thing you can do, which is to join in prayer, right? Um, hmm. And then, you know, we're doing children's classes, you know, um, we're interacting, we're taking responsibility as a community for our children, no matter what background they come from. We're saying these are mm -hmm. all of our kids. We want to provide some classes for a setting for them where they can learn values, where they can learn um, a sense of morality, a sense of right and wrong. We can reinforce some of the values maybe that their parents have already taught them and also help to develop others that maybe they haven't, they have or they have not focused on. So key, mm -hmm. junior youth empowerment programs where we are taking our young people who are, um, you know, who are just on the verge of, of going into, you know, um, um, into their teenage years and then off into adulthood yep. and infusing them with this understanding, this notion of service and, you know, and, and again, just these, this value structure that will help inform them and help them in making um, wiser de decisions for themselves going forward and also for the community. And then we, you know, we have, um, you know, we have study of, uh, of the sacred writings, you know, where we get together and we go through these, uh, these Ruhi courses, which is this, these, this uh, course of books that cover different aspects of the Baha'i faith. So you're, you're collectively coming together you're sharing in fellowship, which is a very natural thing for human beings to do, because we are made, we are communal beings, we're made to be together. And but mm -hmm. you're you're doing it with an intention to really ground that connection in the divine teachings. And mm -hmm. you know, if it's true, and I believe it is true, that um, you know, that that um, all of the divine teachings are the essence of truth and are the source of all knowledge then the best relationships and the best connections that we can build must be rooted in that, in that reality. Um, so, yeah, so I, I think those are the ways that, that, that uh, it helps to build community and helps us to widen this circle of brotherhood. Because we have to take responsibility for our communities, not only for ourselves and our families, but also for the communities in which we live. And we can't constantly point fingers at what other people aren't doing. I have to ask myself, what am I doing? and then make my contribution. Hmm. And one thing I like to ask pretty much every guest is where you personally, Masood, where, where does your struggle lie? What is your greatest spiritual struggle in front of you right now in your life? Wow. Uh, I got a lot of struggles. I think, um, hmm. I think... Hmm. 
I think I think I struggle sometimes with forgiving myself, patience of myself in the journey, you know. Okay. Um, I think um, I struggle with trust. That's still an issue for me, you know. It's still hard. Um, and I, I also have my fears, you know. I have um, I have. My, my soft spots uh, that are tied to memories from my past that haunt me from time to time. Hmm. Um, so those things are there. And um, I, I, I'm glad that I have the coping skills that I have to deal with them. And first and foremost among that is kind of meditation and prayer, which I do every morning. And for whatever reason, you know, it's a very old process. Baha'is aren't innovators of prayer and meditation. That goes back a long way. But what I have found mm. is that uh, there's a lot of wisdom in it because it, it has helped me to kind of center myself and um, and just to be more present. Um, so, and then one of the most amazing things I've learned, man, and this is incredible. I mean, when I'm going through a struggle, when something, maybe a memory comes back or I'm having an anxiety Man, it's incredible. What I found is service is a remedy to that, man. If mm. I can take that mm. energy that I'm spending so much time focused on myself and focus it outward on someone else, I find for me that that is the most powerful way for me to kind of grapple and deal with that sense of aloneness or that sense of isolation or feeling you know, overwhelmed by something that's causing me um, challenges at the moment. So, mm. yeah. So mm. those those coping mechanisms, man, are I don't know where I'd be, dude, if I didn't if I didn't have those things. And the writings, man, are I thank God for for all of the writings. The Baha'i writings, are, you know, it's a wealth, an ocean of of um, you know spiritual teaching. And then you know we go from there, and we can open up the Quran, and we can delve into that into those writings. We can mm -hmm. open up the Bible, mm -hmm. the Old and New Testament. We can go on to the Bhagavad Gita. We can go on to the, you know, to the Buddhist text. I mean, you know, yeah, all of that stuff, there's gems in all of that, man. And it informs my reality and helps me um, get a deeper sense of who I am and uh, my connection to every living thing on the planet. So, yeah. And speaking of the writings, is there a, is there a writing that you carry with you in your heart that speaks to you most deeply? Is there a quote? Yeah, the one that's on me right now is one from Shogi Effendi that says, um, they whose hearts have been warmed by the energizing influence of God's creative love cherish his creatures for his sake and recognize in every human face a sign of his reflected glory. Wow, that's I don't know that I've heard that one before. That's fantastic. Where's it from? Uh, you know? I got it out of I got it out of the Revelation of Baha'u'llah. So it's uh, it's quoted from Shoghi Effendi. I'll have to look in. I'll get you to the the, the source. Mm. But it's Shoghi mm. Effendi. But um um it's referred to in the Revelation of Baha'u'llah. And what moves you? What moves you about that quote? How does that affect you, dude? It's like in every human face a sign of His reflected glory. Everywhere I look. Yeah. What what are you saying right here? Saying over, over Skype. Over Skype. What are you What are you seeing in this? I got to look, man. I can, let, let me let me reflect, face. man. Let me I'm seeing I'm seeing a lot of glory, brother. There's a lot of glory there, brother. <laughs> no, but seriously. So, that's something you take with you to to help you yeah. deal with, you know, difficult people you might be encountering absolutely to make sure you're seeing the divine and every every face you cross absolutely even with people who are challenging especially with people who are challenging people who are challenging are such a blessing and a gift because they help you stretch your spiritual muscles it's easy to be kind and at peace with people who you don't really have any conflict with who are just really wonderful people that are easy to get along with. But when you encounter somebody who's difficult, it's like, oh, okay, I got, I'm gonna stretch some muscles today, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, to have that that writing, that teaching for me is a resource to go back to. And I'm like, man, I'm struggling to see some glory. I know, I know there's some in there, so I have faith that it's in there. <laughs> so, so I'm gonna keep on until I see the glory. I know it's in there. So yeah. <laughs> wow, that's beautiful. Masood, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you and uh, and getting to know you. And um, I also want to mention 
uh, these ongoing youth workshops that you've been doing that my son, who's 15, has been participating in. And I tell you, he has never been more excited and jazzed and inspired by Baha'i stuff uh, than these workshops that you've been doing with Parisa Fitzhenley and Laylee Miller Murrow. Uh, you know, real tough talk about race for young people and solutions to, to race and prejudice and what's going on in the country. And so um, tell me a little bit about that and uh, before we take off. Yeah, man, you know, that was, uh, Laylee Miller Munro was the one who kind of like initiated that process. And she initially had an idea for a youth conference, but of course COVID hit and uh, that kind of, you know, canceled that. We couldn't really gather in, you know, a large group of people gathering in the same space. So she, I think she was just inspired by everything that's going on with the George Floyd um, killing and uh, the the um, uprisings and the civil um, civil disobedience and all that stuff that's going on. And she wanted to, I think she really felt like the um, kind of frenetic energy of the youth, them wanting some answers, wanting to have a safe space that they can go to and unpack some of this stuff and really delve deeply mm-hmm. into it. So she approached me about partnering on this. And, uh, and so we consulted and then Parisa came on and we're so glad she did. And, it, you know, it's just wonderful. I mean, it, Dude, I mean, I'm amazed by some of the insights that these youth have about this issue. And they're full of amazing questions. Um, they're asking challenging questions, difficult questions. Um, mm-hmm. And they're really, they're really just, you know, um, just, just being vulnerable in the moment and being open. Mm-hmm. And we're trying to create a safe space for them to be able to do that, which is why we don't allow any adults other than the three facilitators. Um, but, yeah, it, it's, it's been amazing. Um, I'm getting so much out of it because there have been moments to be quite frank, man, the last couple of weeks, dude, where I've, you know, I've, I've just been freaking emotionally exhausted, you know, like a lot of mm. people and uh, feeling the weight of everything that's going on. But speaking with them just lifts my spirits, man. It just, um, they do so much for me, you know, so. Um, Tell me there's some hope there. Oh, man, there's so much hope, dude. There's 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 so much hope, man. There's so much thoughtful kind of you know, just engaged, like, analysis of what's going on, man. I mean, informed by Baha'u'llah's teachings. I mean, uh, you know, they, they they know that they have a significant part to play in this process, man. And they mm-hmm. are mm-hmm. actively ser- searching for ways that they can make their contribution. So to the, to the extent that Parisa, Laylee, and I can maybe in some small way help them understand or get a sense of you know, a contribution they can make, man. I mean, that's, it, it's worth it, brother. It's worthwhile work. You know, what has happened recently in the wake of the George Floyd uh, murder is a really um, extraordinary moment that we're in as a human family, and particularly here in the West where racism is our most violent, challenging issue. We've arrived at some type of um, moral crossroads, you know, where, um, and I don't think there's any going back. And I think each of us have to decide um, where we are going to, what, where we're going to till our soil, where we're going to plant our, our plow, how we're going to make our contribution to this process. And I'm feeling very much in this moment that, um, that I have to uh, take advantage of all the opportunities that I have to lend my voice or my effort to the eradication of racism. Because this moment, it, you know, it's... I've been exhausted, man, the last two weeks, emotionally exhausted. And I've been asked, um, you know, in different individuals to make a contribution in some way to various dialogues or in whatever way. And I haven't, I haven't felt the heart or the desire to really say no to anyone because the work is so vital and so important. So the exhaustion, the emotional exhaustion, Um, Trying to regulate that, trying to manage that in some sense is a way of making a sacrifice for this glorious, glorious cause. And so many of us are doing it in our own creative and unique ways. And we're on a path trying to get to the same goal. And uh, so I am um, I'm honored to make a small contribution to help us hopefully um, move a little bit uh, further down this road together. Mm. Someone sent me this quote from the Universal House of Justice from their May 9th, 2020 letter. When society is in such difficult difficulty and distress, the responsibility of the Baha'is is to make a constructive contribution 
to human affairs, uh, and that becomes more pronounced. This is a moment when distinct but interrelated lines of action converge upon a single point, when the call to service rings aloud. The call to service. The individual, the community, and the institutions of the faith, inseparable protagonists in the advancement of civilization, are in a position to demonstrate the distinctive features of the Baha'i way of life, characterized by increased maturity in the discharge of their responsibilities and their relationships with each other. And later they say, um, society stands in need of clear voices that can articulate the spiritual principles that underlie such an aspiration. So um, someone had sent that, and as you were speaking, I, I looked it up on my computer because I was like, oh, that's so relevant to what Masood is saying right now. And uh, so I thought I'd throw it into the mix. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that, man. That, that's got me thinking. That's awesome. Yeah. Appreciate you, brother. Masood Olafani, thank you so much for your time. This was just a beautiful conversation and uh, very moved by it. And thank you for all your work and service. I can't wait to check out more of your art, too. Please uh, let us all know uh, what you've been making and building and and painting and drawing and constructing. Will do, brother. I appreciate your rain, man. Great to talk to you, man. Thank you. You got it. Thanks for listening to Baha'i Blogcast. Hope you enjoyed the episode and the conversation. Check out more fun Baha'i stuff on Baha'iblog.net. Thank you so much, and good night.